welcome to everyone to this special place. Friends who have traveled here for the burial of Steve Diamond's body. Here. It seems the only time that we meet up as a community is at a funeral. It just happens all the time. And we always say, we must stop meeting like this. But one after another, after another. And take the book in your raised hand and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the and truth. And nothing but the truth. Please state your full name. Richard John Warwick. I'll just prepare a dose of factor eight. I was diagnosed very late at the age of three years old. I spent a lot of time in hospital. The doctors didn't know what was wrong with me, and they couldn't understand why I was getting large swellings and bruises all over my body. Richard has a form of haemophilia, a rare and severe inherited disorder that impairs the blood's ability to clot. The slightest injury, a graze, an internal bleed, or even just a bruise, could cause irreparable damage. So I'm using my hand range because it's, it's easier for me with me not being able to bend my arms. Every day, Richard injects himself with the blood clotting agent Factor 8. These days, it's sterile and safe, but in the mid 70s and early 80s, a treatment like this infected about 5,000 people in the UK with either HIV or hepatitis C, or even both. Richard was among them, and he had to undergo a series of treatments. It was a, it was a very difficult course, was that. Um, my wife will tell you more about the side effects. Violent mood swings and sweating and swollen joints, swollen limbs. So that was... Um, that cured the hepatitis C. But I'll have to take my um, HIV drugs for the rest of my life. In the 1970s, a new drug called Factor VIII was released. Made using human blood, it promised a much easier life for haemophiliacs. They no longer needed to go to hospital and could self-administer the treatment by injection at any time or convenient place. But it had one fatal flaw about which patients knew nothing until too late. One dose of your treatment might contain the donation of 40, 50,000 people. A lot of product in the UK came from America. And one of the things we now know is that the people giving those donations were um, people who maybe were in prison or drug users, and they were encouraged to give their donations to provide the volume that was needed. We're going to look at a couple of documents now. This is a result showing that you were HTLV3 positive. Yes. And you weren't told of that test result? No. Were you told that you were being tested? No. They basically keep my ankles quite rigid uh, because they're just don't move. And these boots and ankle supports have saved me a few times because sometimes you walk and you, you roll your ankle. And if I didn't have these on, I would have very bad bleed. Come on then, girls. Like other haemophiliacs, Martin has problems with joints, mainly his knees and elbows, caused by internal bleeding. I was diagnosed with haemophilia about the age of six months old. Growing up with haemophilia back then, for a parent, it was a nightmare. Children, they're always running and falling over and banging themselves. And I would have all kinds of internal bleeds and uh, damage to my joints. 
Martin was under constant medical care. First at Birmingham Children's Hospital, and at the age of 17, he was sent to an adult facility. I remember being in the waiting room, and my name is called out. Now, the doctor doesn't even introduce himself. His first words were, hello, I see you're HIV positive. I didn't understand the significance of what he was saying because I was a healthy teenager. And my words to him were, oh, well, that's life. He then goes on to say, that's your life for the next two years. And then I said, what do you mean by that? And he goes, you've got two years to live. That's when it hit me. So we wrote back to Birmingham, and I've got a letter that says on it that I was tested in 1985 without my knowledge. I was found to be HIV positive, but it also says that they found an old sample of my blood from 1983, and I was positive then. But I could have been working away, I could have been sleeping with somebody, and it would have mortified me if I'd have infected a girl. What gives them doctors the rights to play God like that and risk other people's lives? Why didn't they tell me? In 1981, a new and previously unheard of disease was discovered in the United States. Acquired immune deficiency syndrome, AIDS. In January 1982, the first haemophiliac contracted AIDS in the US. Nine more cases had been recorded by the end of the year, eight of which were terminal. Despite this, Great Britain continued to import American Factor 8. Are you proud of your new baby, Chandler and John? We certainly are. And what have you called him? Jason. Jason Evans. JJ. JJ for sure. My dad lived with haemophilia. He really didn't want, I don't think, haemophilia to get in his way. At the time, it was kind of an odd thing for some people to see a haemophiliac wanting to be a carpenter using, you know, these huge saws and swinging wood around the shop and things. But, you know, that's the kind of guy he was. Daddy! What? Bumper's gone. Bumper's gone, has he? Yeah. Where's he gone? He's on <laughs> yeah. I'm very thankful he, he took those videos because it's the evidence my memory doesn't have. He was a father to me and he loved me and he raised me and was doing everything a father should do. So you can learn how to ride it. In towards the late 70s he began to use factor concentrates because that's uh, that's what the doctors were telling him and everyone else to use. May 1983 saw the first reported case of a British haemophiliac contracting the disease. Articles appeared in the press claiming that Factor 8 was unsafe. In November of 84, he raised concerns about the products with his doctors, and they told him, this is just sensationalism, it's fine, you know, don't worry. They convinced him to carry on using fat to concentrate, and then it was only shortly after that that, that uh, his first HIV test uh, came back as positive. Things just became very difficult. Put a strain on uh, the relationship with my mum. You know, they'd only got married, and I think their life went from being one of planning for the future to planning for the end. talked in your statements about one of the worst things being the feeling of stigma, the mm. feeling of being dirty. Mm. Yeah, with, with relation to the HIV AIDS in the early days, you know, um, Christian people don't get AIDS. You felt like you were like, the lowest of the low. Yeah. I mean, when we found out that he was positive, I felt such fear I've never felt before. It's not the fear of what he might suffer, it's, it's social, it's everything, it's children, it's housing, it's your careers. Everything is gone. It was something to be ashamed of. 
even though we'd done nothing wrong, he'd done nothing wrong. I had been a prominent pool player locally. And then one night, I walked into the pub to play my match, and the landlord just pointed at me and said, you, get out. The pool team I'd been playing with, they all stood there. Not one of them tried to defend me. I felt sick. I felt empty. I felt dead. This was a classic case of ill-informed ignorance. Um, you know, but it, it, it doesn't take away the fact that it made me feel like rubbish. My dad lost his job. My mum got sacked from her job. They received hate mail, phone calls making fun of them. The stigma was incredible. It's this whole thing that, oh, if you had AIDS, you were, you were gay, or you were a drug user, or some kind of what they saw to be an undesirable person. By 91, 1992, he had become very ill. He had progressed to AIDS, all the opportunistic infections. He was losing a lot of weight, couldn't sleep, going through a horrible uh, death, and uh, by the end of 93, uh, he, was, he was dead. Jason Evans founded the independent campaign group Factor 8. Its members are the immediate relatives of haemophiliacs who died because of contaminated blood products. His organization provides them with legal help. I really only had one goal when I got involved in campaigning on this subject. I wanted it put on the official record that what happened could and should have been avoided. I think after that point, maybe there's room for better support for people, counselling and compensation and all these other things. But I think for me personally, once it's on the record that there is liability here, then I'll be satisfied. We can see Richard, perhaps most clearly from the bottom <coughs> document, a date stamp, 10th of September 1976. Mm. So very soon after you would have been starting at Trelaws. Mm -hmm. And we can see there the words hepatitis risk. Yes. Was the existence of a risk of hepatitis something you or your parents were aware of at the time? Not at all. We have Kenneth Callender, he's died. Alfonso Raimondi, he's died. That's Gareth Atkinson there, he's died. Ian Wells, I think that he's died. And that's one of the Peach, and that's Jason Peach, he's died. So they're all, they've all died. At 11 years of age, Richard went to Trelaws College, a special boarding school for children with disabilities. There's an NHS health centre on the campus. Students could receive the medical care they needed and attend classes all in the same place. It's also the site of the greatest concentration of contaminated blood cases that the UK has ever seen. What your records also show is that you received significant quantities of factor VIII on a prophylactic basis. They were crazy about prophylactic at Trelaws. I had two real target joints, and that was my left knee and my right elbow. But I, I can't understand why they would give me consecutive doses you know, day after day. Great Britain will be self-sufficient in blood products and will guarantee their purity. That was the government's promise in the 1970s. But um, when the Thatcher government came in, that pledge and that aim uh, went away. So they found a way around that by um, importing this particular product. All these issues were aired very often at meetings of 10, 15 people but they were all held in secret. No one was allowed to publish the, uh, the minutes of the meetings. The main beneficiaries of that secrecy were pharmaceutical companies. These companies had a huge financial motivation to sell these products. 
Today, the facts concentrate market is a billion dollar industry. In order for a company to say our product is safer than this company's, they needed trial data that showed we've used this product and it's not infectious. And uh, in this country, at least, uh, the doctors acted often as consultants to the pharmaceutical companies. There are numerous documents showing that doctors in Oxford, doctors in Cardiff, were keen to test factor A concentrates for infectivity on their patients. To all haemophilia centre directors, although initial production batches may have been tested for infectivity by injecting them into chimpanzees, it is unlikely that the manufacturers will be able to guarantee this form of quality control for all future batches. It is therefore very important to find out by studies in human beings to what extent the infectivity of the various concentrates has been reduced. The reason they used humans instead of chimpanzees was, one, because chimpanzees were expensive and essentially patients were free when they don't know they're part of an experiment. We tried to speak to the pharmaceutical companies that produced Factor Eight at the time. Over the last 50 years, they have changed names and ownership several times, and none wanted to talk about the contaminated blood issue now. What we know now is that the Trelaws are also conducting blood tests regularly and keeping records of liver function tests, which made you think, OK, so what are, what are they actually looking for? You know, if they're giving you a, a, a safe product, why would they be monitoring how your liver is or your, your blood enzymes or your, your, your T cells or your CD4 count? Why would they be looking at these things? Out of the 89 haemophiliacs who went to Trelaws College, 72 died. And people are still dying. Not of HIV now, but of um, liver-related problems related to hepatitis C. I actually feel guilty that I'm, I'm still here. I ask myself the question, why am I still alive? When, you know, 70% of the haemophiliac boys that were at Trelaw College are dead. They're no longer here. And I'm always questioning myself, why me? Why, why am I still alive? Why have I been allowed to live when so many haven't? The official claim was that the new medicines were safe. The most emphatic statement to that effect was from Kenneth Clark, health secretary under Margaret Thatcher's government. I think someone that really has a lot to answer for as a minister is Ken Clark. The well-known Kenneth Clark actually stood up in parliament and said, there is no conclusive proof that AIDS is transmitted through blood products. He really needs to answer for putting out that total misinformation. This was the reply we received from Kenneth Clark's office. Mr. Clark has chosen to decline this request. And from the UK Department for Health. The infected blood inquiry is a cabinet office lead, and therefore they will be the ones best placed to answer your questions. Beyond an initial acknowledgement, the cabinet office has not responded to our request. And all we could find on the official UK National Health Service website was a report mentioning that victims are entitled to apply for compensation. In 2019, and for the first time, the UK government agreed to hear what the victims had to say. A public inquiry was opened in London, and Jason Evans' group, Factor 8, is taking part in it. It's finally happening. It's been a, a long road, and this is a this train journey is one that I've taken countless times over the last three, four years. Even before Jason was born, his father was aware of the deadly disease. In spite of the risk of passing on the contamination, his baby was born healthy. I often think about how would I have dealt with what my dad went through? Next year, I'll be the same age my dad was when he died. And I think about if I was to die, God forbid, next year at that age, 
That would have been really a very short life. But that weighs heavily on my mind. Now, in 1989, Tina um, became pregnant. Yes. What happened? Um, it was an un unplanned accident, shall we say. My wife knew pretty soon after, and she went to see her doctor. And we were advised, really, in no uncertain terms, not to go, for Tina not to go ahead. It, it was all in those few months, all mixed up together. And at the time, we were still reeling from the shock of, and the implications of dealing with the diagnosis. I could have been positive, in which case, what were we, you know, we were bringing up a child at that time to be an orphan. If, if it had come into the world, we didn't know how long we had. Or the child could have been positive as well as me, in which case, was it morally right to give birth to a child that might be, you know, suffer terribly? I couldn't walk away from a man who I was supposed to love <laughs> just when he needed me most. And once we found out that I was OK, Afterwards, um, <laughs> I realised that if I was going to be a mother, it wouldn't be with Richard, and I chose to say with Richard. You said yeah. you have an extremely loving and supportive wife. Yes, and she's just everything to me. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. A source of great sadness to you both has been that you haven't had children. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Ellie. Hello, Ellie. Okay. Ellie, will you? <laughs> I have to say, at the time, it seemed easy. I didn't feel as if we had any choice. It's only later you think, <laughs> what, what if, what if, but, hey. Martin Beard was also thinking of starting a family. His girlfriend was a nurse at the hospital where he received his treatment. I've got the dilemma of haemophilia, passing that on. I've got the dilemma of HIV, not just infecting her, but possibly passing it on to children as well. So took the decision after about a year to split up so that hopefully she could go off and have a family of her own, and thankfully she did. And we're still friends on Facebook, so, you know, and she seems happy, which is good. This is Ruby. Yeah, that's Ruby. And that's Sasha. They're very loyal dogs, Rottweilers are. They're very protective as well. Animals are one of the greatest comfort you can ever have because you can have had the lousiest day in the world but you walk in that house and the dog's pleased to see you the dogs know when you're in pain they know when you're in trouble and it's soothing Two attempts were made over 40 years to investigate the causes of this medical disaster in the UK. But so far, no one has been held accountable. The current inquiry's goal is to gather evidence. The final decision about how to proceed after that will rest with the government. I have no doubt that what happened was criminal. I think the real question is to what degree was it criminal? I mean, I think at a bare minimum, we're talking about some form of criminal negligence and perhaps corporate manslaughter, perhaps as high as murder. And I think the inquiry can help 
direct in some way where, where those lines may lead? The criminal prosecutions have been brought in other countries and they have been successful, particularly in France. Whether they will be brought in this country, I suspect not. The reason they won't bring them, the, the Crime Prosecution Service won't be directed to bring those prosecutions, is because it's widely accepted that they would be successful. And the only way they can avoid a successful prosecution is to avoid bringing it. The public inquiry is expected to continue for at least two to three years. Too late for the victims who have already died and too long for those still fighting for their lives every day. Good morning. Um, our first witness is... He was so frightened of giving himself an injection. I was told I had about a year to live. He was on borrowed time. This was a frightful experience. It wasn't a, a life worth living, really. I don't need to try for exams anymore because I'm going to be dead in a few years. So they all actually died 18 months apart. I didn't think I would come out. Chuck came out of the hospital and he picked him up like he was a doll. Just wanted to die. He had had enough. There's no way that a child should have to die the way he did. I just wanted to be with them. And I believe now is the time for justice. And all we ask for is recognition of our plight and meaningful recompense for the lives we've had so cruelly stolen from us.